Hey, welcome back. This is Glenn Young with Me Our Adventures. Today we're going to take a look at rope soloing. We're going to look at the tools that you need to rope solo. And we're also going to talk a little bit about the applications of rope soloing. So I'll actually start out with the applications. So rope soloing, uh, there's two different versions of rope soloing you could say. The first is lead rope soloing, where you have an anchor that's close to the ground and you are leading. So if you take a fall, it's similar to a scenario where someone is providing a lead belay, you're going to fall a distance and it can be reasonably dangerous. And then the second type of rope soloing, which I'm going to talk about today, is top rope rope soloing. And just like when you're top roping, if you take a fall, the rope will catch you almost immediately and there shouldn't be any dynamic falling component. It should be you catch the rope and then the rope will stretch a little bit and then that will stop your fall. So um, we're going to talk primarily about that today. And the applications for rope soloing, the most obvious for most people is if you want to go top roping and you don't have a climbing partner, top rope soloing is great. But the less obvious and probably the most versatile use of rope soloing is you have a lead climber go up and instead of belaying the follower, they fix the rope, which means attach the rope with a knot or a, a hitch like a clove hitch so it can't move. And then the follower will then uh, micro track, which is slang for a rope soloing tool, a use of a micro traction as a rope soloing device, um, or they'll micro track or rope solo that pitch while the other person rests or hauls the pack, for example, on the other end of the rope or on a haul or tag line. So there's a lot of uses. There's also a way to use this to climb as a party of three with a very short rope where no three people are at the same stance at the same time, which makes it the systems much easier. It makes rope management easier and much more comfortable. We'll talk about that in a separate video. Let's take a look over here at rope soloing tools. So right here, there are a lot of different types of tools, but because I'm in Yosemite, it have been big wall climbing. So I have my big wall gear with me. So I'm gonna use a system that has uh, a, an ascender, sometimes called a jumar, as a component of the system. We have a double length Dyneema runner with two small knots. If you are, have a bigger chest, you may not want or need those two small knots. And if you are very barrel chested, then you may need something longer than this double or 120 centimeter runner. And then uh, clipped through those two small bite knots is a locking carabiner. And note that the so bar the part that joins this into a loop is going to be offset. So it's not up in this area, which will be toward the front of the chest. It's going to be on my back when I'm climbing. Right here, we have a Kong duck. This has a cam inside, so there's no teeth. And the advantage to devices that have cams without teeth is they do a little less damage to the rope. We have an ascender. Just about all ascenders, with the exception of very, very few, which are hard to find, Almost all ascender is going to have teeth, so that's going to bite into the sheath of the rope, and it's going to provide a little bit more security, but also it damages the rope a little bit more over time. So one piece of kit that I don't have here is the rope, and for rope soloing, I prefer to have ropes that are a minimum of 9.5 millimeters in diameter and have a pretty durable sheath. But usually, if I have a dedicated rope, I'm going to use a 9.8 to 10 o. Uh, rope and for top rope rope soling, if you have a dedicated rope that you're not going to use for lead climbing as well, you could even have a static rope or semi static rope at around a 10 millimeter diameter, and that's going to last a lot longer. But it's not dangerous to rope solo with this tool, but it's just going to wear your, out, your rope out a little faster. Um, this, these are my primary devices, and these I call my secondary devices, but are very, very important. I have an ATC for descending. You could also have a gree gree because you're using just a single strand of rope for rope soloing, but I like the ATC because if you're dealing with uh, static ropes, static ropes tend to be very, very stiff, and getting them to go inside a gree gree and repel with a gree gree can be really difficult sometimes, but an ATC does a good job with that. So I still bring an ATC. I bring a friction hitch to back that up for when I repel. This is a personal anchor for clipping in at uh, belays. And also I use this as an extension for my ATC for an extended repel. And then I have a piece of cord. 
and this piece of cord I can use to create a friction hitch above my devices in the event that I get stuck and I need to release my devices. And then finally I have a small pack and inside that pack I have a water bottle, some snacks, maybe my approach shoes. And you want that weight inside the pack be, to be, you know, between like three and five pounds. And this I'm gonna use as a counterweight on the bottom of my rope. A mistake would be to have a counterweight that's say like 25 to 30 pounds, because that's gonna add a lot of downward force. And if there's any traverse in your route, it's gonna pull you off. And if you do need to release a device, pulling that rope up um, with 25 to 30 pounds on it can be difficult. So I like to keep that in like the three to five pound um, range. If you have a really long rope, you could also just use the end of the rope that is beyond the length of the cliff and coil that up to create a counterweight. And then you wouldn't need to attach your backpack. So let's go take a look and see how to set this whole system up with these tools. All right, so here we are, we're setting up now. And what I've done is I had a little bit of extra rope at the very bottom. So I stuffed the extra rope in the pack that keeps it nice and neat. And sometimes at the base of cliffs, you have roots and things. And that wad of rope, even if you coil it nicely, sometimes some of those loops can get stuck on roots um, and can hang up. So I've stuffed the end of the rope in the pack and I've used a clove hitch to secure it so that the bag is off the ground. And that's important because if this bag rests on the ground, it might not provide the counterweight that I need for my devices to run smoothly. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm gonna put on my chest harness. So I've got my chest harness here and I'm simply going to put it over one shoulder. So one of these small overhand knots is to my front. And then I'm gonna make a half twist. So you can see that half twist, whoops, that I've just created there. And I'm just gonna push that arm through that side of the twist so that now that twist the cross is at my back and I bring those together put this locking carabiner through just like so okay. and now I'll set my primary device the primary device is whichever device is on top and that's the device that's going to catch you if you were to fall off okay or if you weight your rope and I'm using an ascender and the most comfortable way to use this ascender is to have the spine of the device pointing toward my chest rather than the handle toward my chest, right? You can see that that would hurt a little bit more versus the spine, okay? And this device is a little bulky. So uh, if smaller device, if you're climbing it off with or something like that, um, might be nice to have there. I'm just gonna talk about this device because that's what I have here today. The next thing I wanna do with a, an ascender is I want this lower locking carabiner to clip around the rope as well. So note that's going right around the rope and it's trapping this rope in place. And that makes it so if I do a traverse or something like that, it's impossible for the rope to start to get out of alignment down over here and cross load because the carabiner is going to keep it in. And now I'm going to clip that into my belay loop. Okay, so now that's into my belay loop. And now this locking carabiner on top is going to go through the top eye of this device and it's going to go around the rope so it's capturing this rope right like this okay and i lock that down well, that's my primary device and i check to make sure it's working by just sitting down on the rope okay so that's going to catch me right but it's always a good idea to have a backup device in the system so in this case i'm going to use the kong duck for that and this kong duck I separate it and you'll see that it has this sort of almost arrow shaped cam at the bottom. I'm going to call it arrow shaped anyway. It's a little bit interesting looking. I want to point that down. So that arrow or where it tapers at the bottom is going to point down. So I point that down and then I load the rope in just like that. Close those plates. And then my locking carabiner is going to go through this hole here. Okay. Just like that. Okay, and I check to make sure that's working by pushing down on it. Okay, so that's working. So if I failed to lock this device properly, or if at some point uh, the cam accidentally opened up, then uh, I have a secondary device on there. Okay, so now I'm ready to climb. And if I get to a point where I think I might fall off, right, and I start to fall, then the devices interact and catch, right? This chest harness also keeps me in 
a little bit, which if the root is a little overhanging can be kind of nice. One of the other things that I wanted to talk about with rope soloing is there is, there is one large danger with rope soloing, which is you are on a single rope that's under tension and the spot on that rope that might be going over a sharp edge isn't changing. And what I mean by that is if this is a climber here, as they are belayed up, if they're being belayed up to the anchor and they fall on this sharp edge, one spot in that rope might get exposed to that sharp edge, but as they continue to climb, that spot, spot that fell on the sharp edge of the rope before is then higher up, and now a new spot is exposed to sh that fall on the sharp edge, which makes it safer than a rope soloing where the rope doesn't move, it's only the climber moving. And as a result, you can have one spot on the rope exposed to that sharp edge over and over and over again. So if you are rope soloing, it's a good idea to check to make sure that where edges are rounded. You can pad the edge itself at some cliffs, but more commonly what's acceptable is to use um, a pad on the rope. It's kind of a tube made out of a durable fabric, or sometimes you can even use plastic hosing. and put your rope in that to protect it from the edges. So let's just take a look, quick look, a close up look at what that looks like if there, you have your rope stretched over an edge and you take a fall on it. 